talking, uh, let's just go ahead and introduce ourselves. Does that sound good with y'all? Sounds great. Sounds good. Excellent. Okay. So, um, David, do you, do you want to start? Uh, sure. So, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Can y'all hear? Yeah. Okay. All right. I see thumbs up. Perfect. I'm impressed. We've got a lot of people who are uh, not waiting for the Braves game to start. I'm impressed. <laughs> Um, so I'm David Jones. I am an executive vice president at the William Mills Agency. Um, so what that means is I am a, a team lead. I lead one of our PR teams. Um, as an agency, we specialize in business-to-business -business fintech PR, so financial technology. Um, so all the stuff that I'll talk about kind of will be shaded by that viewpoint. But um, I actually did not start my career there. I started in the nonprofit world. I worked for the Atlanta Mission for about four years out of school. Um, and then made the switch to the agency life after that. So um, I've been at the agency for a little over 15 years and uh, hope I can uh, share some great insights with you guys on what we've seen and learned over the years with uh, working with great reporters like Tyler, so. Awesome, thank you, David. And Tyler, what a nice entryway into introducing yourself. So why don't you go ahead and tell us what you do? Yeah, of course. So my name is Tyler Nicole. That's my TV name, that's what I go by. Um, I just graduated from Georgia State actually in May, so I was where you all were not too long ago. Um, I moved down to West Virginia from Atlanta in July, started my career as a news reporter out here. Um, and yeah, I started a show out here. We have a new four o'clock broadcast. That's what I was hired to do. And like David said, I work hand in hand with PR every single day. So I will hope I can share some tips on how the relationship is on my perspective. Awesome. Tyler, that's extremely impressive that you're a recent grad and already have your own show. That's incredible. So thank you. Thank you. Definitely excited to hear the, the conversation at hand today. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. How I have it laid out is um, David Tyler in terms of questions. So mm -hmm. hopefully while we're asking these questions, we can also have conversation just from yes. different points of view. So feel free to like, if you want to you know, jump in, like, even if it's like not exactly your question, like jump in like with anything <laughs> yeah. you have to add, um, mm -hmm. that would be awesome. So, um, okay, so David, the first question is for you. And it is, what is the goal for PR pros when working with journalists? Well, absolutely. So, you know, really, obviously, goal number one is to try to find a story that the journalist would be interested in, you know, where, whether you're working at an agency, or you're working um, on behalf of an organization or a business, you know, as PR pros, our job is to try to communicate a story through someone else. And so our really goal number one is to secure a story. Now, of course, obviously, reporters don't want stuff that's uh, overly salesy or not um, relevant to their their beat or what they're trying to cover. So, you know, building a good story is more than just, you know, calling someone and saying, hey, you should write about me. You know, you've got to think about why. But Really, at the end of the day, you know, our goal is to to get coverage for our clients or for our companies. Uh, but the secondary goal, I think, is to be a resource for our journalists. You know, we take a lot of pride in the fact that, you know, we'll have re reporters will reach out to us and say, hey, here's something I'm working on. You guys have been a good resource in the past. Is there anybody you have that can help me? So, yes, goal number one is to help our clients or the people who are paying our paycheck. But our second goal is to help the journalists because that really is the best way to, to build a strong relationship is to be a good resource for them as well. Awesome. All righty. So real quickly before we um, jump to Tyler's question, um, I just I picked out. So you mentioned a beat. Um, yes. So for I for some of our um, new PR yes. major, you may not know you may not know what a beat is. So would you mind explaining uh, what a beat is? Or absolutely, and I'll let Tyler jump in there too. But you know, reporters, you know, they have uh, essentially every reporter will generally have something that they're responsible for. You know, in a smaller publication, they may be responsible for everything. So in that case, their beat may literally be everything. But you know, um, for example, working in the financial technology space, you know, we work with a magazine called American Banker. And some of the reporters, they write about technology. Some of the reporters, they write about mortgages. Some of the reporters, they write about Washington, D.C. and legislation. And so I'm not going to go to the D.C. and regulation reporter and pitch him a technology story. He doesn't care. Uh, and he'll think it's a waste of time. So, yeah, the beat is really just what that reporter or editor is responsible for. 
Yeah. And for example, like my beat um, at WDTV is culture and lifestyle. So that's the type of reporter I am. So like he said, I don't really pay attention to press releases that are involving politics or things like that. They just go in my junk mail. But if it's about nature or about culture or different things like that, that's the type of stuff that catches my attention because that's what I specialize in. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for um, for clarifying and giving us some insight. Um, all right, Tyler, so piggybacking off of David's first question with what is the goal for PR pros when working with journalists? We're going to flip that on its head. What is the goal for journalists when working with PR pros? Um, I think David actually said it very well. Um, like he said, making sure that this story is actually of interest to us and making sure that it's not salesy and pitchy. Um, so the five W's are very important. Who, what, when, where, why. If I don't see that within the first two sentences, I'm clicking off the press release. So um, I'll give you an example. I work very closely with the West Virginia Department of Tourism because I love nature stuff. So the PR person for them, her name is Lauren, we have formed an amazing relationship because Anytime I have stories that are interesting to me with nature, I know that's exactly the person I can go to. She's very communicative. She's very reliable. So building those relationships with PR pros, I would say, um, matters to me also. Um, but yeah, to basically ensure that I'm able to create unbiased information uh, to deliver to our viewers. Because like he said, PR, you are working for your company. You have your client's best interests at heart. But when you're a news reporter, you don't have anyone's best interests at heart. You're just reporting the facts. So making sure that that's yep. exactly what we're doing. We're reporting the facts yep. and it's not agenda driven. Hey, you've got your audience's view at heart. That's that's who you're reporting. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, great. Excellent. And thank you. I, I already love this conversation because I feel like y'all are giving it to a straight Tyler with the two sentences and I'm not, I'm not going any further. That's awesome. Yep. So thank you for your candid responses. Um, okay, let's keep going. So David, how often mm -hmm. do you pitch to journalists in a week? So I'm going to answer on behalf of my team because, you know, having kind of being in more of a manager role, I actually don't do much of the, as much of the daily pitching as I used to, but as a, our team that I work with, they're pitching every day. Now it's not always a press release. You know, I think sometimes uh, even our clients sometimes get caught up in the idea that PR equals press releases. And we all know that's not true. Um, but it might be trying to line up a spot on a podcast or trying to line up a, a byline article or an interview. But I would say every day where, you know, someone on my team is reaching out to a member of the press to work with them on something. Um, it's sometimes more formal than others. You know, we do have some pitches seem to be more formal than others. Sometimes it's more of a following up on a previous discussion. Sometimes it's an invitation to meet someone at a conference. But yeah, I, I would say there's rarely a day goes by that we're not touching base with a member of the press. Awesome. Great, thank you. So then Tyler, how often do you communicate with PR pros or pick up press releases in a week? Um, so like he was saying, PR is not just press releases. So I talk to PR professionals on a daily basis. Um, most businesses and organizations have someone who's representing them. So when we're looking for story ideas, that's usually who I have to communicate with in order to actually get my story. So I communicate with PR professionals every single day, um, press releases more so. I would say I read them every day as well, but story ideas may not come as frequent from press releases. I'd probably say like, maybe every week or every two weeks I'll get a story idea from a press release but I am in contact with PR every single day to try to line up stories and try to you know get the details and facts absolutely awesome great so that's like it's an everyday thing it's awesome okay so then David what is <laughs> the hardest part about working with journalists I feel like because the vast majority of us in here are PR majors. We, mm -hmm. we hear about, you know, like what to be aware of and, and whatnot. So give it to straight for someone who manages people that does this every yeah. day. And Tyler, <laughs> you will get your chance to flip this on its head too. <laughs> what is the hardest part about working with journalists? I would say the hardest part, honestly, is standing out from the noise. Um, I don't know about Tyler's specifics, but, you know, I've talked to reporters that we work with that will tell us that they get well over 100 pitches a day and out of those 100 maybe a little over half are probably relevant so 
you know, it's trying to stand out from the noise and finding a way to get their attention. And there's different ways to do that. Um, it can become you've built a reputation out of consistency so that, you know, if a reporter has worked with your company or with you individually long enough and knows that, hey, these guys aren't, aren't going to waste my time. They're only going to reach out when they've got something good that can help you stand out. If you've got a good subject line that can help you stand out, you know, if you can find uh, what Tyler mentioned earlier, two sentences, you know, find a way to, to get the the, new, the information in there quick and fast that can help you stand out. But that's probably the hardest part of working with journalists is standing out because they are so busy. Um, I'd say the second hardest thing is probably um, working with deadlines because I feel like journalists today are so much, have so much more on their plate than they did even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, the, the, the good side about having almost all media be online, whether it's print, video, podcast, is there's so many outlets and opportunities for folks like us to, to pitch stories, you know, uh, a daily website that or a website that's updated daily, they need content every day. So that creates a huge, a huge opportunity. The flip side is these publications are also running on skeleton staff. So they're like, oh, well, we can, because we can't, the advertising revenue that comes from online is less than what used to come in from print. So we have more content, but we're trying to do it with fewer people. So um, the, the second challenge is honestly just tr trying to work with reporters who are overwhelmed and overworked and under tight deadlines and finding ways to make their life a little bit easier whenever you can. Awesome. So I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, so what what are your best practices, I guess, for, for making a journalist's life a little easier? And Tyler, <laughs> definitely feel free to jump in on this too. And, and some of this may uh, get a little bit into one of the further questions, but I feel like, you know, job one is do your homework so that you're not wasting their time. Um, only reach out when you've got a story that you know will be of interest, um, that you know is relevant to them. And honestly, I'll say, even when you do all of your homework and you pitch a reporter you've worked with or a reporter that, based on their writing history, you know should want to be interested in this, they still may not be. It may not be the right timing. It may be that they've written about something about this recently or they're planning on writing a different angle on it. Um, but by doing your homework, that's the first way. And then the second part is, have all of your ducks in a row. You know, when the reporter responds positively and they're like, okay, this is awesome. Can we get an interview set up? And then you reach out to your client. Your client's like, oh, I'm on vacation for the next week and a half. Well, now you've wasted everybody's time because you got the reporter all interested in something, but you can't deliver what you promised or what you thought you could. So kind of honestly, the the pitching may take, you know, all of 15 minutes to write a, you know, to write your email, kind of revise it a little bit and get it sharp. But the real work goes into preparation, knowing, you know, kind of doing your homework and kind of preparing all the little talking points you'll need, being able to answer a reporter's questions. If they follow up, they may have a question of like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more or what angle or could you get another person in there with us? You know, as much as you can be prepared to, to answer those questions quickly and to meet their deadlines, because they may respond and say, oh, this is great. Can I get this filed by like three o'clock tomorrow? I'd love to talk to your client, you know by end of day or at best, you know, nine o'clock tomorrow morning so that I have time to turn this around. And the more receptive you can be to that, the, the easier it is to, to stand out. Awesome. And Tyler, you know, just piggybacking off of that, you know, what, what are ways that PR pros can make your life easier? <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely, like David said, do your homework because we have, we turn stories every single day. So when I come into um, my office, the first thing I'm doing is looking at story ideas if I don't already have something lined up for the next day. Um, so we have about three or four hours to turn a package, a minute and 30 information to be ready to go on air. So like he said, if I'm reaching out to you, you emailed us and you're like, oh, I have this really great story. You know, I'm working for so-and-so, I'm representing them. We would really love it if you could talk to us today. And I reach out to you, I'm like, hey, David, I love that story idea. Are you able to speak at 10, 15? You're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't. Well, like he said, I wasted my time and I'm probably never going to reach out to you again because it's like, <laughs> yeah. I have to go back to my news director and say, oh, Brent, I'm sorry. I don't have a story idea for today. It fell through. And so it just puts everybody in a, a pretty tight situation. Your client mm -hmm. is you represented and I don't get my story idea. So nobody's happy at the end of the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Tyler, I'll actually ask, because I know this is a question even we always, we'll, we'll get clients asking, oh, what's the best time to reach out to a reporter? Like, and I know it's different for individuals, but, you know, kind of talk through what maybe a TV newsroom looks like and what the schedule looks like, depending on whether it's a morning or an afternoon broadcast and, and help people keep in mind, you know, those kinds of time frames. Yeah, of course. So I can walk you through my um, day to day life. I am not a regular reporter. I do way more than any other reporter at my station and it's <laughs> of this new broadcast. So do not take this as industry standard at all. Right. You, try to, you know, switch from PR and go into the news reporting route. Like, don't let this scare you. But um, <laughs> basically, I get into my office at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, I immediately start working when I get in. I don't have any breaks. So I go to my email. I will look at some pitches that people have sent me. I'll also go to other local publications and see what type of story ideas I want to do. Um, our pitch meeting is at nine o'clock. So I'll pitch my stories to my news director. Within that time, I also am responsible for cutting two national um, Vosach, which the Vosach is a voiceover and a sound on tape. I don't know um, how to explain that a little bit more. So like an interview would be a sound on tape. And then, of course, over is a whatever. So um, I'm responsible for cutting two national votes off. Then I'm responsible for going out, getting a local story, coming back, having my script in by 2.30. Clips are in the folder by 3.30. I'm on air at 4 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> very, very tight schedule. And on top of that, like he said, journalists nowadays are responsible for a lot more than what we used to be responsible for. That's why they call us like multimedia journalists. We shoot our yeah. own, stuff, edit our own stuff. We put our own web stories out. So it is a lot. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry, can I ask another question? <laughs> Go for it. So, so Tyler, you know, something else we're seeing, you know, I've had reporters tell me that, you know, when an article is published or a video clip is published, they love it when we share it on our own social media because that's how they get recognition from their bosses of people, you know, eyeballs and all those kind of metrics. Is that important in your world as well? Um, I will definitely say sharing our work is important because it also, it just gets our faces out there, gets our voices out there. And like you said, we don't really get pats on the back for our work. So when our sub is <laughs> featured, it's like, wow, I really did good. Like, oh, they love that. Um, I've had a lot of people who have asked me, like, can you send this? We would love to post this um, on our page, you know, for their own PR. So mm -hmm. uh, I just did an interview with a drug awareness program that is traveling around the state here. And they were telling me, like, oh, my gosh, the coverage you did is amazing. We're going to use this video if we're allowed to on our own publications, you know, so mm -hmm what we do so it does make me feel good when my work is shared it's not the end all be all but yeah. it is, it does but more, more eyeballs in your videos can only make your editors more impressed too so exactly well I edit my own stuff so it makes me more impressed yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> that good is point. definitely true it is yeah mm -hmm. that is awesome and holy cow yeah journalists are Crazy, super busy, and you're just one example. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, awesome, love this discussion, y'all. Um, okay, Tyler, so I know we took quite a bit of detours, but it was all worth it. Um, so we've covered like how we can make your life easier. Tell us, what is the hardest part about working with PR pros? <laughs> What do you wish we understood more? <laughs> um, I think the deadlines is probably my thing. Um, and then understanding that if, if you know it's not a newsworthy story, just reach out to the sales department and ask how much an ad is because <laughs> a lot of the guys will get things. And I'm like, there is no way that they thought we would run a news story on this. It's like my client lost 87 pounds in uh, three weeks. You should interview them on how. And I'm like, that's an ad. Like that's not a newsworthy story. <laughs> so just like we said, knowing what is newsworthy and what is not? Do viewers need to know this information? And is it going to help someone's life? If it's going to benefit somebody, definitely pitch it. If you think that, wow, this story could really change lives. I feel like not only that, it could touch some people. This could be, you know, a great thing for people to see. Then you pitch. But if you're like, I know that this is sounding more salesy. Like this is his fifth car shop he's opened up and you want to interview him. That's an ad type of thing. So I guess differentiating what an actual story would be versus, you know. A, a and the thing story. is, it's so easy to take what could be salesy and to find a way to turn it into a story. Like I was thinking about your example about the, the I, my client lost 87 pounds in three weeks. Man, you could easily turn that into a, a, a you know, 
something like, you know, a look at what are the different trend diets out there and which ones are actually worth doing or not, you know, that turns it into a story versus just, hey, look at my client. <laughs> I would love to do something like that. But unfortunately, my news station is like no fluff. So that's and, why I'm and that's fine. That. But, you know, you, again, it's about knowing the beat. It's knowing the, the, the publication and some publications like fluff. I mean, that's what they're into. So if you have fluffy stories, go find the fluffy publications. That's a good, that's a good example though, too, David. Like, like you said, some news stations, like my news station is hard news. That's what they want. They yeah. want hard news. They don't, my producer absolutely hates lifestyle. And it's crazy because like, I'm a lifestyle culture reporter, but <laughs> right. she hates lifestyle stuff. She wants hard news. So anything like that, that I bring up to them, they'd be like, be for <laughs> So... <laughs> You just have to, like he said, you have to know. But if you were to send that pitch to a place like, say, Complex or mm -hmm. um, Inside Edition, they may pick that up because people like to read stuff like that who visit their publication. So it yeah. just depends on the news station. Yeah. And even in like the, the business to business world like I'm in, there are definitely publications that will do more fluff than others. So I mentioned American Banker earlier. They're very much a hard news. They want news stories. They want, you know, in-depth analysis of top issues. We've got other publications, you may not call them fluffy, but they are built more around what they would call like thought leadership. They want like how to articles and it's like how to roll out a new banking app or how to better communicate with your customers or how to do this. And that doesn't sound that fluffy, but in the world of, you know, business to business, you could kind of call that fluff. And it's not, it's still educational. It's not really salesy. We're not going to be putting our clients as product names in the piece or saying that this is the product you use. But it's still, there are certain publications that like that versus just the hard news. So it's always, you know, there's always ways to find someone who could be interested in your story. I was just about to say that as well. Definitely, because some of the stuff I do get from PR professionals, I will say to myself, that is a really cool, like, you know, topic. That's a really cool piece. But of course, I'm not able to do it because we also are a local news station. Right. So I feel like, you know, we have to cater to local news. Versus if I worked for a national publication, I'm sure we would run stories from, of course, anywhere in the nation. Yeah. So it just depends. Like we were saying, it just depends on who you work for. You don't want us to pitch you uh, stories about Atlanta anymore? <laughs> I would love to be in Atlanta doing culture reporting. You don't even know, right? <laughs> One day we'll get back there. Oh my gosh, y'all. This is awesome. Um, Okie dokie. So, um, and just just a quick thought that I, I had pop up into my head when we were talking about the fluffy publications versus the not. Um, would you say like, David, like you mentioned, like some publications, they, they want like how to articles. Would you say like, you know, for for people like me, OK, who's hoping to land a full time job in PR, really right. focusing on like copywriting and stuff like that? Right. Or would would you say maybe if I'm looking for a fluffy publication, I should look for publications that publish more like content pieces, like content writing pieces versus the news pieces? It depends. I mean, it, it really will depend on where your audience is. You know, business to business is different from business to consumer. And even in the consumer world, you know, you've got travel versus science versus technology. Um, really the best way is to read. Do, Google searches are your friend. You know, if you've got a keyword or a phrase that you're trying to kind of build around, Google it and see what publications pop up and check their byline. So like if you go to a, a site or a publication or a podcast or whatever, and you see that most of the stories are written by staff members, that's a publication that whether that's hard news or more um, lifestyle or how to's, you're going to need to pitch an interview. If you go to a site that is, you see a lot of contributed articles like the authors are from companies or the authors are listed as guest contributor. Those are ones where you've got a better chance of pitching a story that you will end up writing either yourself or on behalf of a client. Um, so that's one of those ways you can kind of look when you're looking at a publications website is to see if it's more of a staff driven uh, re interview driven publication or whether it's more of a um, they are looking for contributing content. But and now I'll give the caveat sometimes that contributed content is sponsored. Um, Sometimes it's not. So that's where you have to reach out and find out, are there opportunities to write what we call earn, you know, free, or does the uh, company you're representing have to cut a check to get a sponsored slot? Thank you so much. All righty. So 
David, the next question is for you. And I know we've kind of covered this, yes. but mm -hmm. um, what is the best way to get journalists to read your stories? I know we've talked about newsworthiness mm -hmm. and so on, but is there kind of like a like a checklist you, you follow or best practices that you found? Um, Tyler touched on a couple of these. One, keep it short and sweet. Um, bullet points can be your friend, um, you know, short sentences. Make good use of your subject line. Um, you know, if you know, I'm thinking about, you know, in Tyler's case, if you want, if you've got a story that it's not obvious that it's local to West Virginia, make sure you call it out in the headline, you know, that this is of interest, you know, find a way, again, you only have so much space in headline, but sometimes the hardest part is writing shorter because you've got to get a lot of information shared in a very short amount of space. Um, so have that who, what, when, where, why. And I actually think the why is probably the most important. Why should this reporter care about this story? What does it mean to their, their audience, whether it's listeners, readers, et cetera? Um, you know, if you have background information, you can sometimes put that like below your signature. You know, like a lot of times if we've got a release that's supporting a pitch, we'll put our pitch at the top of the email, short, sweet, one paragraph, maybe a couple bullet points, you know, here's what the news is. Here's why we think it's important. Here's a couple things your readers might get out of an interview. And for reference, here's the release. And we'll always just copy it into the email. We've quit sending attachments because there's so much uh, problems with phishing and people trying to send attachments that may or not. So unless a reporter asks for an attachment, we usually don't send an attachment. Um, so we'll just copy the, the release or the background or one pager or whatever it is that we're trying to provide background information on at the bottom. So that way they can look at the top and be like, okay, yes, no, this is of interest to me. Okay, here's a little bit more information, enough to get their interest, but maybe not enough, you know, that they'll still want to reach out to us, that kind of thing. So um, I'd say the second part is, and this one will depend partly on who you're working with. So, you know, if you're working at a, a, a large agency or you're working on behalf of a large national brand where your media list is changing regularly, it's a little bit harder to do this. But a lot of us will find ourselves in um, situations where we're working with, say, a local or regional company or we're working with an agency like ours that specializes in one industry. Yes, there are times where I'm taking a swing at the Wall Street Journal or at Bloomberg or one of the large national pubs. But 90% of the work we're doing, we're working with about 50 to 60 publications. That's a fairly, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, that's a fairly small audience. And so you see the same names and the same people. And really one of the best ways to, to kind of um, get journalists to read your stories is to consistently deliver. Um, it's hard when you're new. And so hopefully you're working at a company that has a good reputation. Um, but the more you do it, and even as you change jobs or as reporters change, you know, jobs, I can't tell you how many times we'll start with one reporter who, jumps on at a small, you know, credit union oriented publication. And then five or six years later, they're writing for bankrate.com. Well, they've already got a good impression of us and they carry that relationship and they carry that, that attitude towards us along. And so it opens up doors to larger publications over time. And some of that's individual, you know, you do good work no matter what, and you'll build that reputation. And some of that can be institutional, whether you're at an agency or a company or an organization. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Tyler, next question is for you. What makes a story stand out to you? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, so I feel like what David was saying, um, the why is usually what makes it stand out to me. Like, why would my viewers want to watch this? Is it going to help someone's life? Is it going to change something in someone's mm -hmm. life? Is it going to benefit them in some way, shape or form? Why does this information need to be on TV? So um, definitely. Yeah, building the relationships as well, too, because when you have a relationship with a PR professional, most of the time, Lauren will call me if she has something that is really cool, like they just partnered with all trails. So she's like, I want you to be the first on this. So she'll call me and be like, hey, before the other news station hears about it, we're doing this. Like, could, would you want to cover it? Do you want to set an interview up with me? So being proactive and like make those relationships, I'm telling you, are key. Building those relationships, because like he said, we're going to look out for PR professionals and they're going to look out for us. When I need a story idea, I'm telling you, I can always call Lauren and she has something for me to do. Or not only that, um, today we had like Governor Jim Justice in um, the studio for an interview that was all related through his PR people. So mm -hmm. even things like that, but we wouldn't have known that. He was going to be here if my news director wasn't close with his PR person. Right. He was like, hey, Governor Justice is coming through Bridgeport. He's only going to be there for 30 minutes. But did you want us to stop by and do an interview with you? My, my news director's like, of course, we would love to have the governor. In <laughs> yeah. 
But if he did not have that relationship, that story would not have happened. That interview would not have happened. So um, stories stand out to me based on, like David was saying, the who, what, when, the why is really important to me. Um, I'm only gonna probably skim through. And once I find that, I'm like, oh, okay, that's what it is. I'm either gonna reach out to you or it's going in the junk mail. So it's not really much because we don't really have much time to like dive in and do a lot, a lot of research. If something interests me, of course, I'm gonna do my due diligence and do homework on the company and the pitch that they're sending me. But most of that, you know, that's their job to make us want, want the story. So just making sure things are trendy and not always clickbait though but some clickbait yes. is good because it's going to get me to click on it and be like oh that's interesting so you also made a good point you kind of mentioned about like you didn't quite say but the word exclusive i think is a big piece so you know with a press release obviously your client wants that news as broadly spread as they can but it is absolutely if you know you can't do this with every story but there are stories that are big enough like if it's a client that uh, i'll use a great example we um we've got a client that they they're a startup they just signed their very first bank. And that's a big deal. Banks take like six to nine months to make a purchase decision. So it's a huge deal when one signs up and um, kind of trust to take on a, a new company that's not proven. So they were super excited about it. We thought that was big news. So we went to a publication called Bank Automation News that we've got a great relationship with. We said, hey, this release is going to be going out in about two weeks, but we would love for you to get first stab at it. Because we think, you know, it, we knew it fit their beat, it fit the reporter's interest, and we knew that reporter liked to talk to banks more so than they like to talk to tech companies, and the bank was willing to jump on the line with them. So we were able to set up the call with the bank and with our client at the same time, and they talked about the strategy, and they talked about why they were, you know, looking to work with a new company versus, you know, some of the other older, more established companies in the space and what they were going to get out of it, and that piece you know they told the reporter told us hey i can have this ready by you know the day that your release is going to go out um and we said perfect uh we'll plan to put it out on and actually the release just went out i think it was monday we'll put the release out monday um she said that's fine i think my article might run tuesday but if you want to put the release out monday that's still fine because we've had plenty of time to build our story and it's an exclusive to us again you can't overuse it you know and please never tell two or three different publications are getting exclusives because th that's not what that word means and i have seen people get burned on that but you know when you've got a big story or it's a super big deal for a client that can be a great way to help your story stand out as well awesome. so um follow-up question then so when you are distributing um your press releases or, or just general like your news um have you found so because relationship building seems to be a huge part of the pr mm -hmm. and journalism relationship um do you tend to post your uh news releases like on the wire at all or do you just go down your own media distribution list so we use both actually um if we have a client that's putting out an actual press release we do encourage them to use the, the wire um, there's a couple benefits to that. The primary one is the syndication, what we call the syndication factor. You know, if you post it on Business Wire or PR Newswire or some of the, at least the more established ones, it will get picked up in places like Yahoo Finance. It will get picked up in a lot of local publications. We know they're not on the pages that are being read, but what it does do, and especially as long as you've built your release well with some good backlinks to it, with some uh, SEO terms, is those backlinks are very important for your clients to help build their search engine optimization, to help build their Google credibility, um, help raise their Google score when your people are searching for those keywords. To us, honestly, that's the true value of a business wire. It's you will get some coverage, um, especially you know if you're using one of the the I'll say call it the more expensive wires like PR Newswire or Cision or Business Wire. You can usually you know as part of your packages you get to select a few beats. So like, for example, we always select the banking beat, you know, it's kind of a, a, a free add on to whatever the, the local circuit is that you pick out. And so some of the publications we do care about will pick it up. So there's some payments publications that will syndicate the news and our clients like to see that, you know, I've never send the client the full business wire list like, oh, look, you've got in 500 publications because then they look at me and like, yeah, and maybe three of those are relevant. But, you know, we will call out those three and say, hey, this is syndicated but it's still valuable, it's in the right audience. But more importantly, we're helping raise your SEO. So there are definitely times we don't use Business Wire if it's a piece that's not worth the expense because it is expensive. You know, those releases can run anywhere from four to over a thousand dollars depending on how long they are and which 
uh, distribution networks you want, if it's regional versus national versus international. Um, so they're expensive. So, you know, we do counsel our clients that, hey, this is a big story. You probably should pay for the wire for this one. This one's not as big. Why don't we just pitch it to our own, you know, targeted media list and go from there. Awesome. Thank you. And Tyler, do you pick up from the, the wire at all or is most of your, are most of your stories found through personal pitching and relationships? Yeah, most of my stories are um, personal and I kind of do my own research just because it is local news. So I'm sure when I move to a national news publication, I'll be using the wire a little bit more, but there's not much about West Virginia on there. So <laughs> I was to get out and do my own research. Understood. Okay, awesome. And then the last question uh, that I have for you before we open it up to the floor, um, and this is for uh, both, but I think we can just keep going in this order, David, Tyler. Um, <laughs> Do you believe PR and journalism need each other? Why or why not? Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, uh, well, one, if PR and journalists couldn't work together, there wouldn't be a PR industry. We'd all be out of work if you know if we couldn't work with anybody. Um, but no, I, I do think they need each other. You know, there is so much information out there that, um, you know, I feel like journalists do value when they work with good PR pros. Now, you can easily go online. There are lots of sources to find bad pitch blogs and reporters who like to vent about the, the poor PR pros they work with. And it can definitely be a double-edged sword. You will find reporters who are curmudgeonly or grumpy or don't like to work with PR pros. But at the end of the day, there is a lot of information out there. We need journalists to tell our stories. And most of the time, I feel like journalists you know, need those good connections with the PR pros to have access to the people who can help them tell their stories. Awesome, great answer. And Tyler, your answer? I was gonna say, I mean, David said it perfectly. I can't even- Should have let you go first. <laughs> I know. Um, the only thing I would add to that is my anchor and I were talking about this earlier because I was telling her I'm doing this and she was helping me a little bit with the questions, but I feel as though PR and journalism is like a book. Where are the words and they're the pictures. Without, mm, like without the pictures, you wouldn't want to read the book. Without the words, it wouldn't make sense. So mm -hmm. that's how I feel is the best way to describe our relationship. It is definitely a necessity. Definitely. Awesome. Tyler, we may have to quote you on our social media with that one about the pictures <laughs> and the words. That's awesome. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. Y'all have given us so much amazing insight into you know, what y'all do and your relationship with either PR pros or journalists. Um, so thank you so much. And now's the time that uh, all these lovely people in the room and our people on Zoom, this is your time for questions. So people on Zoom, um, you have questions, please drop them in the chat and either I can read them or you can um, call out your answers, but let me know um, either in the chat or raising uh, the hand if you have a question. Um, and then, yeah, so this is the beauty of having the phone in the room. Um, Carson, I know you have a question. You want to come up and talk to our speakers? Okay, cool. Now I'll talk about Sure, okay. All right. Back. <laughs> say, too close to the speaker, right? Yeah, we're still too close. Hello. Hello. So um, my first question is a lot of times in like our PR classes, they would say that journalists like have an agenda and that you guys like set an agenda for like what you're gonna cover. And I know that you said that you do like um, like more lifestyle stuff, but do you feel like your, your um, I guess like editor maybe, like does she have like a, like an agenda of like stuff she's trying to like push out or like a, like a trend she's trying to create or does that make sense? You know what I mean? I get what you're saying. Um, I don't have to disagree. I don't think we have agendas. I think some, okay. uh, some organizations may have agendas, but 
my news station, we don't have agenda like agendas. We just push out the information that we feel our viewers will want to see. Um, so yeah, I would say my, so I guess I don't have an editor. I am my own editor. So my producer, I mean, like David was saying, we have like beats. So maybe that's the agenda. We have things that we prefer to do, but breaking news is breaking news. National news is national news. Like things like that are always going to go into your news broadcast, but I guess you can cater your show depending on what you want. So like the four o'clock show is a little bit more lifestyle driven. So we try to stay away from really sad topics in that show but we have a five and six show where we cover more hard news and um more casualties and like tragedy stories will go there so i feel like yeah there's different newscasts that may cater to different things but i for i can only speak for my news station i definitely know our news director would not be okay if we had an agenda <laughs> set um if we had an agenda on what we were and we're not gonna post yeah okay Awesome. Yeah, and I'll add to it. it. Again, it comes down to knowing your publication. So, you know, not to pick on the, the cable news stations, but, you know, they have built their brand over the last few years, all of them, you know, Fox, CNN, you know, that while they have their hard news sections, a lot of their programming is built around opinion stuff. And so in that case, there will be agendas, you know, you will have an editor who is looking for an agenda. And often that agenda is I just want controversy. I want something that will get people talking or riled up. Mm -hmm. um, to take it on a more boring level, I mean, even in the banking industry, you know, it agenda may be a strong word, but like there are publications that say cut over the credit union space. And because they know that their um, audience are credit unions, and I'll give you a little inside baseball. So credit unions and banks, let's be honest, for all intents and purposes, do the same thing, but right. they're structured differently and they kind of have a uh, rivalry, you know, credit union. So if I'm pitching a credit union publication, I'm not going to pitch a story about why banks are better. I'm going to pitch a story about why credit unions are better. So it's not an agenda in the sense of the story may be skewed, but it's knowing what audience they're serving and what they're trying to communicate to the audience. So if it's you know cable news, they want something controversial. It's okay to stir the pot then and be controversial in your pitch. Mm -hmm. If it's a political commentary show, you can know where that you know research and find out where that commentator or the host of that show wants their story to flow? Do they want, you know, something that's more left or something more right or something in the middle? If it's hard news, keep it straight. It's not gonna have the agenda as much. If it's, uh, you know, if it's a reporter that has built their reputation on uncovering um, fraud or government waste, they're probably not gonna run a story about how awesome, you know, the local government, uh, um, organization is working, they're going to look for fraud stories. You know, if Jim Cantori is showing up, you're pitching him, it better because there's a hurricane. He doesn't care about sunny days. So mm -hmm. agendas, yes. I mean, everyone has the thing that they're interested in, but it's because that's what they're geared towards. It's very rarely um, just because they're trying to be difficult. It's they mm -hmm. have an audience that they're trying to serve and they expect you to know that audience when you reach out to them. Okay. I'll piggyback off that too, David. Um, I feel like agenda driven news is going to be more so like he said your national publications of news mm -hmm. with local news it's it's even hard for us to find regular stories here on a day, -day right. let alone be biased against what we're going to cover so that's what i mean when i say like for my news station there's there there's just no possible way for us to be agenda driven there's just not enough local news so yeah. national news of course like he said like i know y'all have heard of uh, carlson tucker and like things like that who very controversy, very <laughs> Fox and different things like that. So, I mean, it just depends, but for more so local news, mm -hmm. it's going to be very hard for a local news station, especially in a lower market, how I am. When you get up to top 10, then okay. Um, so like Atlanta, DC, New York, LA, Chicago, places like that, that have a large mass of people, mm -hmm. you're, you may find more agenda driven news. But or they have competition, right? When there's four TV stations, they each need to build their own niche. So they're going to mm -hmm. tailor a little bit. Um, it's funny, even in like the technology world, I think it's on like TechCrunch, they want to cover startups, but they only want to cover the ones that are getting big amounts of money. So like, we'll have a client that's like, oh, I just raised $3 million. I'd love to be in TechCrunch. I'm like, well, we can try. But one, they want it to be exclusive. And two, they very rarely cover startup funding announcements unless it's at least, you know, 50, 50 million or something like that. So yeah. could you call it an agenda? Maybe, but it's really more of just knowing what it is they're interested in. 
Our goal is to just cover the news of our competition does. Yeah, make sure you get out there before Channel 12 is out there. So that's the only agenda I would say we have. Is yeah. <laughs> we have the most accurate, fastest coverage. That's really it. Yeah, that's good to know because I definitely thought it was more... I don't want to say like deceitful, but like, I thought it was like more like, we're trying to like start this policy. So we're going to like make the news this, but mm -hmm. that's really helpful. And then my next question is like, do like another thing that they recommend is like to, you know, like take a journalist out for like coffee and just like mm -hmm. talk to them and like build a relationship or um, maybe not like treat them to the coffee. I don't know. I've heard mixed things like buy them coffee <laughs> or don't. But like, is that a thing? Like journalists being like taken out and then you like get introduced to that PR person that's like in the new role or something like that. Tyler, I'm gonna let you ta ta tackle this one first and I'll share what we've seen from our experience, which is probably different because we're in the business to business world. Yeah, I was gonna say, David probably, he probably is gonna be able to tell you that they may do things like that. But like, again, local news, we are not getting taken out on the coffee <laughs> day. Maybe when I eventually make it to E! News and I start covering, you know, celebrities, different things like that, people will be like, oh, I want her on my good side. So mm -hmm. they would take you out, you know what I'm saying? Or they want you, they like the way you write. So it's like, oh, I, I really want to pitch this to you. So getting you kind of in your comfort zone and then like, you know, putting the hard news on you. But I have never had that happen to me working in local news. I've never been treated to coffee. I've never been treated to anything. I've only met even like a couple of PR professionals in person. Most of the time it's over the phone. They're setting up what I need them to set up. And when I get there, it's their client who I'm interviewing. Sometimes they'll be on camera and I'll interview them, but they're mostly behind the scenes usually. So, mm, no, see. I haven't really gotten that. That sounds <laughs> lovely though. So <laughs> it, you're right. And I, and I know that the reason they say that is because, you know, you do, people tend to build stronger connections when you get together in person, but it's honestly very hard to do that. Um, you know, if you're working only in a local market and you're a PR person, and you're in West Virginia, yeah, please call Tyler up. She might appreciate that coffee. But, you know, in our case, we're in Atlanta. Most of our clients are not in Atlanta. Other than there's maybe one or two reporters we work with who are in Atlanta. So we're actually not around them to take them the coffee. Um, what we do, though, is we do look for opportunities where we might have a chance to interact with them in person. So um, conferences are a big deal for us. And so uh, right now, actually, October, November is kind of a busy conference season. And so our clients are going to different conferences. If it's a big national conference, the media are also going. We're trying to set up meet and greets at those conferences. Sometimes they are interviews for specific stories or um, so a great example. We've got a show called Money 2020 coming up at the end of October. Um, there's a, a gentleman who runs a podcast called Bankadelic. We kind of were talking to him. We kind of gave him a list of all of our agency's clients are going. He said, OK, great. These five I'm super interested in. Let's set up some time for us to do some recording. So that's going to be an in-person thing. Um, but a lot of times it's more of, I have five to 10 minutes. Why don't I swing by? You give me a quick update of what they're doing. Um, but at conferences, you know, we'll also take advantage of, you know, there's receptions at the end or, you know, yeah, you can meet up and say, hey, let me buy you coffee in the morning before we get going. I'll give you a rundown of who we're talking to. I'll be honest, it's in the conference world. It's more of less coffee and more of, let me go get you, let's go get some drinks afterwards. Or there's a reception that this client is throwing or our client's throwing a reception. We'd like to invite you um, again, same conference. We've got a client that's sponsoring a concert. It's foreigner. So we've invited, you know, the tier one press that they're most interested in. We've all invited them to come to the concert, you know, for free, maybe get some time with their CEO before the show starts. We'll have a couple take us up on it. A few won't, but you know, they're like, okay, free drinks, free music. Yeah. That sounds like it could be fun. Um, we do have to be careful though, because there are a lot of publications do have rules and limits on the kind of gifts they can have so like right. um i know a lot of publications you know they a reporter is not allowed to really accept any gift over about 25 dollars, you know because they don't want to have the impression of coverage being bought so like at christmas time again we're not local to most of our reporters we do actually send like a, a five dollar starbucks gift card digital gift card to our reporter list as a way of saying hey we know you've been busy have a coffee on us if your company policy doesn't let you have the coffee, you know, it's digital, please forward it or donate it to someone who can use it, you know, that kind of thing. So and there's still ways you can express your appreciation, but yeah, the in-person coffees, it's hard to do it. And sometimes 
they'll even say, I'm just too busy. <laughs> so thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> just gonna say that David I have zero time in the day to go grab coffee yeah unless they're uh, sending it via uber to deliver it to you right <laughs> yes well thank you guys so much that was really helpful okay. you're welcome all right hello uh, I have a question uh, specifically for David. So you yes. talked about in the beginning, you started out uh, doing nonprofit and now you're yes. doing fintech. So mm -hmm. I was curious as to how your transition was from nonprofit into agency mm -hmm. and what you like and dislike uh, about both sides. Oh, fantastic. Great question. Um, so when I made the the switch, you know, what I quickly learned was PR is PR. You know, the the basics of building a strategy identifying audiences, crafting a message, finding different ways to get that message out. That's the same regardless of whether you're at a nonprofit or at an agency or at a company. Um, what I found was the biggest difference switching from nonprofit to agency life was one, having multiple clients. So at the nonprofit, every day, all day, we were focused just in on their messaging. You know, And of course, in a nonprofit world, the PR is geared to raise awareness, ultimately to drive donations, because the donations, of course, are the lifeblood of how a nonprofit stays in business so that they can serve the, the people that they're trying to serve. Um, and I loved a lot of it, you know, but nonprofits, with the exception of some of the really large national ones, most nonprofits are small. So I was the entire PR department. And right out of school, that was awesome because I got to do everything. I got to do the press releases. I got to do the uh, donor newsletter. I got to help organize the events. Well, that part wasn't awesome because I found out I'm not great at event planning and I don't love it. So when I went to agency life, I was actually looking for a more media relations oriented um, agency because I honestly do not like event planning. Some people love event planning and that's a key part of a lot of PR programs. Um, but, you know, the benefits of nonprofit is one, you know, if it's a cause you care about, it's very motivating. Two, you can get a lot of experience very quickly because, you um, Oftentimes you're asked to do a lot. So you'll touch all areas of the PR communications marketing world. Um, it was beneficial to me to be very active in PRSA at that time. Um, because again, downside to being the only per PR person is you didn't have any body to really help out internally. So it relied on building a network of peers to bounce ideas off of, ask questions of. I was uh, fortunate enough that one of our board members on the at the at the uh, nonprofit at the time. Uh, owned an agency in town. It was uh, Jackson Spaulding, if you guys are familiar with them. So, you know, I had a mentor that I could bounce things off of and talk to and ask questions. Um, but when I made the switch to agency life, you know, the, the core PR stuff was the same. The things that were different were learning how to adjust, you know, shift your day between clients. So at the time, you know, when I first started, I was thinking I was working on three or four clients, you know, in that first year. So each day, you know, I could only dedicate maybe an hour or so to an hour and a half for each client, or one day I may spend three hours on one client, but that means I need to spend less on them and work on another client. The deadlines are always shifting. And then the time tracking, you know, just the fact that, you know, now we're working on clients and billable work. So there was a, a stricter level of time tracking so that my bosses could know what my workload was, how often we were working on clients. If we were over serving them, do we need to ask for more money, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, but, you know, I found the switch fairly smooth. Um, and honestly, I made the switch through connections. Uh, the my, my boss at the time, I had met through PRSA, and I had been involved in a couple of the committees. And so she, you know, inquired with those people that I had been working with on committees of like, all right, so what's David's uh, work ethic like? What's your impression? You know, what have you heard? And she got glowing reviews there. So that's why I was able to make the jump. All right. Sweet. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Come on, let's do one more question. Okay. All righty. Well, it looks like at the moment we don't have any more questions in the room. Um, I, I will be monitoring Zoom just to make sure none of our Zoom peeps have any questions, but um, 
David, thank you so much. Actually, I yeah. was just about to ask. Yeah, so um, I dropped my LinkedIn in there for you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Tyler, would uh, would if you have a LinkedIn, would you mind dropping that? Of course, give me one so I can pull it. Okay, so if any questions come to mind for, for anyone, a lot of our members love to take pictures of the links and, and whatever. So thank you. And then um, after this, we will uh, hopefully grab a group picture if that's all right with y'all. And um, yeah, then we'll, we'll call it a night. But seriously, thank you guys so much for your candid responses to all of our questions. This has been a wonderful conversation. So thank you. You're certainly welcome. I'm trying to log in to LinkedIn, but I don't really use it on my computer. So I may just have to send it to you, Lauren. That's all right. Uh, we, we've got a chapter newsletter. I can put that in the chapter newsletter for anyone <laughs> who wants to connect. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Oh, you're, you're welcome. All righty. Well, Tyler, don't stress about it. Um, if you want to shoot it to me in an email, or I know you've been communicating with Bernicia, we can we can uh, work that out. So don't worry about it. Um, everyone, let's grab a picture. So Dr. Weed, what is the best way to do? This? What do you think? So just so um, just so y'all know what's going on, we're gathering in front of the big screen. Um, right. So I'm going to run over there and hop in that picture. You'll hear our faculty advisor say, one, two, three, the NPR say. <laughs> okay. um, so, so you'll know that the picture will be taken and your pictures will be on the screen. Just so you know. Okie dokie. All right, then I'm going to stop this video and it, just wait for the one, two, three PRs to say. So, thank you. Okay, y'all. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> big bucket of whatever, sure. All right. One, two, three, PRS essay. Okay. That was good. Well, <laughs> no, we got to work on the PRS essay part. Come on. <laughs> All righty. Tyler and David, thank y'all so very much um, for joining us this evening. This was like, I, I mean, I keep saying it, it was a wonderful, fruitful conversation. So thank you. Um, really appreciate you, you know, dropping your links in, David dropping your LinkedIn in the chat and Tyler, yes. I will definitely send yours out um, through our newsletter. So thank you guys so much. And I hope y'all have a great rest of your evening. All right, absolutely. You do the same. I actually just found it. So I put it in the chat. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> thank you so Fantastic. much. You're welcome. All right. Thank y'all very much. Have a great rest of your evening. Of course. Thank you too. Well. Thank you. Nice meeting you, David. Nice to meet you, Tyler. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. If anyone still wants to take um pictures of that chat, it's uh, it's available for you. Y'all, what a great conversation. Yeah. I know. Yeah, no, honestly. And the, I love that because they they were like, it got to the point where it was 6.15 and I know y'all saw my questions on the screen, but it got to the point where I was like, I'm halfway through my questions. I was like, this is like rapid fire. <laughs> I was like, can I keep up? Um, so yeah, what an awesome meeting.